tell us about plasma waves in layered superconductors? Okay. Thank you, Premi, and thanks to organizer for inviting me to Trieste. I'm very glad to be back here in person after a few years. Um, today, we'll try to, to tell you a story about plasma waves in layer of the metals and superconductor. Actually, this is an old story in a sense, so I will try to make a long introduction to explain what was the, um, the puzzle that we found recently to, that uh, interested us and try to to address again this problem. So I really want to start with something everybody knows because we studied in the undergraduate school, uh, which is uh, essentially the, the way in which you describe the propagation of electromagnetic waves in a metal, okay? So usually we start the standard textbook from Maxwell equation for uh, electric and magnetic potential. The way matters enters is via the current, in particular the current of electrons, uh, which is induced by the electric field. And if you use a very simple through the model for electrons, we can solve out this um, equation in a very simple way, especially in the regime where the frequency is much larger than the scattering rate of the electron, which means that the electrons at this frequency are like dissipation less, okay? So you just plug everything in and you discover that you can decouple the transverse and longitudinal component of the electric field. This is for an isotropic system. And then in particular, you find out that there is an equation for the transverse component whose solution is a wave, which propagates in the material only when the frequency is larger than the plasma frequency, because this is the regime where the dielectric constant becomes a positive number. And then you can find the real solution to the wave equation. On the other hand, for the longitudinal component, you can even have a solution for zero longitudinal, zero component, somehow this, uh, a self-sustained mode of the system, and this happens when the dielectric function goes to zero, and this is exactly the plasma frequency, okay? So what we essentially learn in standard textbook is that, uh, yeah, this is the way the electromagnetic uh, waves propagate in the metal, that is the transverse plasma polariton, it is often called, and then for k going to zero, the limit of the plasma polariton dispersion is the, the energy where you can have a longitudinal plasma in the system. The small dispersion here is just due to finite compressibility of the electron gas. And here is just a sketch of the quasi-particle continuum in a simple uh, Fermi liquid. Of course, in an interacting system, you can also have a lot of additional state here, even for zero momentum, but this is, let's, let's say, the paradigmatic case. Okay. <clears throat> What is the origin of the longitudinal mode? Let me just uh, refer it in a slightly different way. We said that this is uh, a longitudinal solution. So the oscillation of the electric field is in the same direction of the electric field itself, okay? Um, and this happens just because there is a Coulomb interaction between a charge in a system. So if you try imagine to have a plasma model, you just shift electron with respect to the ions, you create a charge imbalance. This charge imbalance creates an electric field in the opposite direction and so on and so forth. This is why the longitudinal oscillation of the electric field are essentially connected to the oscillations of the density, okay? And this is why as condensed matter theorists, we usually study the plasma just looking at not at the solution of Maxwell equation, but at the properties of the density fluctuation in a metal. So in other words, the way in which compute the longitudinal electric uh, function is via the pro properties of the density correlation function in the presence of long-range Coulomb interaction. So you have the standard relation between epsilon and k, and k, sorry. Which means that essentially the zero of the dielectric function are the poles of the density response. So somehow longitudinal plasma waves appears in conventional system, and this is how we compute usually, as the poles of the density response. Of course, dressed by the Coulomb interaction. What does it mean? That a very simple standard way to get it, it would take a model of the electrons interacting via the Coulomb interaction, mm -hmm. and then you dress up the susceptibility via, via um, the long range Coulomb. So chi zero is the Linda function, it's just the spectrum of, of the metal uh, without a long range Coulomb interaction. And then out of this, you can compute the, <coughs> the, the plasma. Notice that this is a model of electrons interacting, okay, via Coulomb potential. So the only way electromagnetic field appears is via scalar potential. So essentially, there is no sign here of the gauge field, the transverse gauge field, or the longitudinal one. And the reason is that the scalar field is the one that gives you the longitudinal component 
of the electric field. So if you're only interested to study longitudinal filtration of the longitudinal component of the electric field, a description via the scalar potential or in other way with the Coulomb interaction between electrons is enough, okay? And this is uh, <clears throat> why then as to, as to do again with the fact that in an isotropic system, there is a complete decoupling between longitudinal and transverse degrees of freedom. So I can study the plasma polariton and the plasma wave in two completely different sectors that do not talk to each other. And this is again, just a sketch of the very standard calculation. This is the result that you get for a normal metal. Uh, you see to, to get real dispersion of the plasma, you have to take the, the Linder function to expand for large K over omega. And then you get here this typical omega, uh, typical dispersion of the plasma and the K square in the numerator, which is just, uh, the signature of gauge invariance of, of the theory. So susceptible density response for finite omega and k going to zero has to be zero. Okay, so far so good. So <clears throat> what happens in the superconductor? In the superconductor, we know that we have a breaking of a gauge symmetry. So we have an order parameter with an amplitude and the phase, okay? So the amplitude of the order parameter is what appears as a gap in the spectrum of the single particle excitations which means that if the quasi-particle continuum, even for zero momentum, is pushed above twice the delta, but everything occurs in an energy scale, which is of the order of terahertz. So one terahertz is four milli electron volt, which means energy scale far smaller than the, the typical scale of the plasma, which is electron volt in standard metals. So there are these modifications, but actually who cares? At the energy of the plasma, we don't expect to have any, anything new to the appearance of superconductivity. However, there is something very nice from the point of view of the description of the plasma, that once that you are in the superconducting state, it's extremely simple somehow to get the dispersion of the plasma, just looking at fluctuation uh, of the phase of the superconducting order parameter um, with respect to the mean field solution. So we break the symmetry, theta zero is finite, the phase is rigid. This is what happens in the superconductor. The phase is rigid it also means that we can measure fluctuation of the phase that we cannot do in a metal, okay? And this fluctuation describes in a very beautiful way, a simple way, if you want, technically the plasma. Why this? Let me go again I, I around the, the, the very standard description of that. If we, we can make fluctuation of the phase in space on time. In space is what we get from classical Gisbull and Dow theory, okay? You have a Gaussian mode, which means that the energy cost to create phase fluctuation goes to zero when momentum goes to zero. And so you have the gradient determining the phase and the coefficient is the phase stiffness. So the ratio between superfluid density and mass of electron. So this is what we were asking to Alex before. So why we could not recollect this, uh, the, the typical cost of making a phase gradient. As we will see later on, this phase gradient can be promoted to a cosine term if you want to take into account discrete structure of the system, but this is more or less what happens. Now, if you want to do dynamics, we need to put time dependence, okay, to get frequency. How we do that? We, we need to make a phase twist of the, um, twist of the phase in time. What is the coefficient of the phase twist is the charge compressibility, just because charge and phase are conjugate variables. Or if you want, because the time derivative of the phase is connected to the, to the chemical potential, so derivative with respect to the chemical potential are the charge compressibility. So this is what you get. And this is why in a superfluid helium, which is neutral, you get the sound mode, okay? This is the sounder way. But superconductors are charged, okay? So we cannot forget that uh, charge compressibility is stressed by long range Coulomb interaction. And then actually the short range charge compressibility has to be replaced by the long range one, which goes like the inverse of the, of the Coulomb potential for K going to zero. And then you just make this exercise. You take this model, you write in momentum space. You see gradient theta square is omega square. Uh, grad theta uh, in space is k square, but now the coefficient of the omega square goes like k square because of a long range Coulomb. Then you have a k square overall, and then here you have omega square minus a finite value. And this is the way you get the plasma in the superconductor. Notice that uh, the, the, the Gaussian theorem is not uh, violated in any way. Gaussian theorem just tells you that when the phase is uniform in space, energy goes to zero and this still goes to zero because we have K square. Gaussian theory doesn't tell you anything about dynamics. And then the dynamics of the phase in the superconductor is pushed to very large energy 
And this is that they gain the plasma energy in the sense that in usual superconductor stiffness for very low temperatures of the order of the density of the electron. So we get again the same frequency that we got in the metal. Okay. But then we also understand there is a, um, some additional degrees of freedom, if you want, in the superconductor, because we can play with the possibility to have a very small stiffness, at least in some directions or in some, in some material. And this is the typical case in layered superconductor. A layered superconductor, whose hallmark example is given by cuprates, is a system where I have very good conducting planes, which also need a very good, very large stiffness to make the phase gradient of the phase in the plane. But the, the planes are very weakly coupled. So the stiffness connected to the fluctuation of the phase between planes, neighboring planes, can be very small. So this energy scale becomes much smaller than this other one. You can even be in the situation where this out of plane plasmon becomes smaller than the, the optical gap. And this means that we have the, uh, the possibility in a light the superconductor to have a low energy mode, which is undamped, which is below the gap, doesn't mix to the particle all continuum, and then it emerges only in the superconducting state. These are reflectivity measurements in cuprates. Notice this was, was already discussed many years ago, okay? And then you see reflectivity above TC, 45 Kelvin is flat. It's also a very small number. These are bad metals in the C direction. Then you start uh, decreasing the temperature. You see a plasma age which appears, is better seen here. And as you lower the temperature, the plasma age is always more well-defined. The reflectivity goes to one. So the plasma age is again what? Is the penetration of the transverse wave, which only occurs above the plasma energy. So this just show you that there is a plasma, which is soft, 0.5 terahertz, and only appears below TC. Okay, so now you are in this situation. You have these two energy scale, large and small. And then you can ask yourself how now the, the plasma, the longitudinal plasma, or the transverse plasma polariton uh, propagate for finite momentum. Okay, how do we go from these two energy scale to the general momentum dependence? Okay, and of course, this is, this is a problem which is relevant for many spectroscopic and, uh, and probes. I will discuss this at the end. Now, again, people ask themselves this question many years ago. Okay, and then the first question, the first answer is, okay, let's do what we also can do in a metal. Okay, let's, uh, let's imagine that we are interested in what happens near to the large energy scale, the in-plane plasma. And then we just make the, the same uh, uh, game as below. before. We take electrons interacting with the Coulomb. I do RPA of the electronic uh, susceptibility. The only things I have to do to account is the anisotropy of the Lindner function, because now transport in the plane and transport out of the plane will be anisotropic. Then we plug in the, the typical expansion of the Lindner function. What we get is an extension of the plasma dispersion for the isotropic system, where you see that now the in-plane and out-of-plane plasma frequency are somehow weighted with the ratio between in-plane momentum and total momentum. Okay, and this is uh, this was discussed in the context of metals. We saw discussed in the context of superconductor, and actually this kind of expression and even let's say the generalization in the case of uh, taking into account the full discretization of, for example, in the C direction, they work pretty well. For example, to describe experiments by resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, which are experiments which are focused on large large energy. Uh, Pierce, just a second, uh, near to the to the <clears throat> to near to the large plasma energy and for varying momentum. So you see here, this one L equal to two corresponds if you want KC equal to zero. So if you put KC equal to zero, this is one. And then you have this, you see this, it's not very evident because uh, this, this flat dispersion. If you instead you take a KC, which is finite, you can have acoustic like dispersion of the plasma and this is what is measured. So, so Pierce had a question, yes. Pierce asks, are you making a distinction between transverse and longitudinal plasma? Yeah, I, I am doing it. And actually, what, the, what is this, uh, this expression here is actually, actually the expression of the longitudinal plasma. Thanks for the question, Pierce. I will come back to this uh, later. And one can also write uh, um, an analogous for the transverse, if you want, in the same approximation. But this is the longitudinal because this is what people measure with the density response. So in resonant in axial ray scattering measure the density response of the electron. So it's correct to take care, to care about the 
density, the longitudinal plasma in the system. Now, this expression, which works pretty well, also compared to the experiment for large momentum, has a very peculiar behavior. If now you fix the angle, if you want, between of the wave vector respect to the C axis, and you go to the momentum goes to zero, you have a continuous of possible solution. This is just a function which is non analytic in K going to zero. So essentially, for K going to zero, you can have any value of the plasma between the low, the low plasma and the large plasma. But it is in contradiction with the Maxwell equation. Why is it in contradiction? Let's take again our two far, far by low and per low, and let's consider what happens in the, in the anisotropic system. As I said, the matters enter with relation between current and electric field. In the isotropic case, the, the, the conductivity is just a diagonal matrix with a coefficient, which is the stiffness, which is the same in any direction. Now we are saying that the stiffness in planes differ from the stiffness out of plane. Or if you want conductivity in the plane is different from the conductivity out of plane. And then the current in general is not parallel to the electric field for any direction of the electric field, while it is in the case of the, of the isotropic system. And now what's the problem? If you want to solve now on pair laws for momentum going to zero, this term disappear. Just this is cross H is just K cross H, okay? And then the only possible solution that we have of Ampere's law is that J is to be parallel to E which means that the only possible solution for K equal to zero is either the out-of-plane plasma sorry, or the in-plane plasma. There cannot be a continuous of solution for K equal to zero. So somehow the RPA solution that gives you a continuous of possible value of the plasma frequency cannot be correct for momentum going to zero. Yes. Yeah, can I just yes. clarify question? Where, where did the distance from the layers <clears throat> I missed that. No, here it doesn't appear because essentially I'm when I'm writing this one, sorry, when I'm writing this uh, this expression, I'm making a, a long wave limit in any case. So this is a KC much smaller one over D and KAB much smaller one over A. But of course, this can be extended. As I said, this plot here actually has to do with the full periodic solution, taking into account distance between layers. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Wow. Four, yeah. Right? What if you take the full formula for chi? So will you see from the numerator that residue will vanish except for full the... formula for chi? What do you mean? Full formula for, for susceptibility for the dressed or for the bell? For the dress. For the dress. No, okay. The that you said that the, the residue cannot be a canteen. Yeah. They find a canteen of the denominator. Yes. What happens with the residue of this? I know with the num the numerator is not helping. I mean, the numerator is only giving you the, the, the spectral weight uh, where you have the continuum. So the problem here is that uh, you only have, you're only dealing with the Coulomb potential and chi zero and nothing else. So you cannot get any other solution, which is not this one in this model. So the point, this calculation cannot give you anything else than this, which is actually correct for large momentum, but it looks to be wrong for small momentum. So the residue will still vanish when K goes to zero. Point. Ah, yes, yes, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. And this is also why you see here, you have a much lower spectral weight than here, right. essentially. Right. Okay, this is the reason why. Okay, so sorry, didn't get the question, sorry. Yeah, so this is gauge invariant if you want in, in that respect, but it's not correct. Okay, um, why then we expect our, probably RPA is wrong? Because as I told before, RPA is some, approximation which relies on the fact that we only account for the effect of the Coulomb potential or if you want to the scalar potential. So somehow only longitudinal degrees of freedom are included, but when uh, the current is not parallel to E, in general, you can have a mixing between longitudinal and transverse degrees of freedom that is not there in the RPA solution. But then people also notice this, and there is a full uh, uh, literature of uh, uh, community studying the behavior of the um, propagation of wave near to the soft uh, out of plane plasma. And this was motivated especially by experiment in the, the last year with a very strong terra air pulses, because with the terra air pulses, you can try to excite MOS, this low energy plasma, or something else I will tell you before. And actually, the description usually goes even beyond the long wave limit. So usually people start from Josephson like model. Again, uh, this is a uh, just as a like model for the phase uh, difference between planes. If you take uh, expand the cosine, the leading term would be somehow a gradient out of plane. So you again recognize that this is the stiffness. And then uh, how the electromagnetic field is included in this description in the full way. Electromagnetic, uh, you do the minimal coupling substitution. 
So the out of plane phase gradient couples to the gauge field, the Z component, here also the distance between plane answers. Then you write down a Maxwell equation for the internal uh, component of the electric magnetic field. You make a given set of approximation that are not always so transparent somehow in the way they, they appear. And then you end up with an equation uh, for this uh, uh, gauge invariant variable. And you see the sign here is uh, what you get, essentially the current that you get, we should derive the cosine term in the, in the um, XY model. And then you find out that for, if you take the linearized version of this, so you replace sine with psi, you get an, a dispersion for your plasma. This would be the transverse plasma. And this dispersion starts from the out of plane plasma. You can have a dependence on the in plane out of plane momentum. And this is a perfect analytical solution for k going to zero. But you always end up with a low plasma. Okay, there is no way here you can end up with upper plasma, which is also somehow reasonable because, as I said, it is an approximate solution. So this is the point where we started to, to, to struggle. Uh, we are, essentially, we had the two communities uh, working hard for, for, for many time using two completely different descriptions of the plasma. And these two expressions do not match each other, and you, you don't know how to go from one to the other. But this one works very well for high momentum. This one works very well in this region of energy and momentum. And so somehow we, we wanted to understand what is the full dispersion of the electromagnetic waves in this layered system. And uh, how do re really the, the limiting expression present in literature can be uh, recovered? So what is really missing in one description or, description or in the other? And most, most important, as I just mentioned, uh, all this experiment with terrestrial spectroscopy needs to, to include a nonlinear effect for the phase degrees of freedom. So instead of the gradient term of the phase, I want to have the cosine. Okay, this is what I mean with the nonlinear. So I would like to have a model, which is essentially an extension of the XY model, including nonlinearity, with the correct discussion in the, in the linear regime, and play with it to, to study experiment in terrestrial regime. And finally, of course, discussing eventually new experiment with the, with the next uh, generation probes uh, in intermediate energy and momentum um, range. <clears throat> okay, I, I'll try to, to, to tell you now what we did in practice. We, I said at the beginning, the description of the plasma with the phase degrees of freedom is very simple. So let's do this, this again. So we start with our action for the phase. Let me start again from the isotropic phase. Instead of having, a, so the matter here is described via the superconducting phase. It only enters in this way, okay? And then instead of adding external interaction between electrons, I add explicitly the electromagnetic field, which is the internal electromagnetic field. So fluctuation of electrons in the system generate electromagnetic field, okay? And this I can include via the minimal coupling substitution, and then I can take right down the typical standard electromagnetic action for the, for the scalar potential and the gauge field. Now look here, the minimal coupling substitution tells you that the gradient of the phase is coupled to A. But this also means that when J is a constant in isotropic in space, the phase only couples to the longitudinal component of the electric field, which is already written in Schiffer book, okay? Which means that if I choose, for example, Coulomb gauge, the only effect which is important is the one for the scalar potential. So I can integrate out the scalar potential in this picture, and then what I get, the electromagnetic action for the scalar potential is what? Grad phi square. I integrate it out and I get the dressing of the compressibility, as I did in the previous case, adding Coulomb interaction. Okay, so again, why playing with interacting electron, which means electron in the presence of pairing and Coulomb, or playing only with the scalar potential is perfectly equivalent. In the, in the tradition, in the literature, people prefer to work in this way because usually you can take this action, you can decouple the Abbott-Zanovich field both term, and then you write out this way. But this is completely equivalent to this. So bottom line, in the isotropic case, only the coupling of the phase to the scalar potential is important. But if the system is anisotropic, so the difference in the plane and out of plane are different, you see that now this gradient term, this is the gradient in the plane, this is the gradient out of plane, do not allow me to decouple the phase degrees of freedom for the transverse component of the gauge field, which means that in the isotropic system, the mixing of a longitudinal transverse component that I already noticed at the level of Maxwell equation 
appears at the level of the behavior of the phase degrees of freedom in, in the way that I have to retain the couple of the phase to the essentially to the magnetic field. I have to include the retardation effect of the magnetic field, unless I'm in some regime where I can neglect it. So this was just the, the main point, if you want, then we worked out the problem. I will not give you full details, but the idea actually, once that you understand this, calculation are extremely simple and you can do it yourself in a few steps. So you write the action with the phase, the scalar potential, Coulomb potential, electromagnetic action for the, for, the, for the electromagnetic field. This is another tricky point. You have to choose the right variables to make the problem simple and the right variables are the gauge invariant phase or the currents, if you want, okay? You can introduce this variable. You can take the gauge phi equal to zero. In the superconducting state, somehow the gauge fixing is much easier than in the normal state. And then you just write down what is the action for your, um, these are current fluctuations, if you want, in the plane and out of plane. Let me now call with, uh, let's say, let's fix the momentum in such a way that the in-plane component is only along A. So you see here, the fluctuation of the current in the plane just described the in-plane plasma. The fluctuation of the phase along C only described the out-of-plane plasma, but for finite momentum, so for the for momentum, sorry, for a generic momentum, which has both C and A component, there is a coupling between the two. And this is somehow what was neglected in a, before, if you want. And then this means that if you want to find the solution, you don't have to decouple second order equation for the in-plane and out-of-plane plasma, but you have a quartic equation in omega. You just take the zero of the determinant, you get the plasma mode. And this is simple, it's analytical. You don't have to do it numerically, okay? And then you get, the, you find out a generic expression for the plasma mode at any momentum, which has the feature we want. You see really the mixing between the two plasma. You see a function which is analytical for k going to zero. And okay, let me just add that, that uh, here I'm working at a zero infinite compressibility. So the plasma will have no dispersion. You can add it just slightly more complicated, but it's still analytical. Okay, let's look at the solution. How do they look like? Yeah. <clears throat> If you want to do it diagrammatically, you have to take into account the density current correlation function. Which means that you take the little anomalous and normal. No, this, is a, this is has to do with the, with the fact that you, I mean, usually when, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you, can, uh, you can write any density, density, and current, current correlation function, the superconductor, and both of them will have, will have you know, diagrams with the uh, normal and anomalous green function, okay? Here, what I'm telling you that you also have to take into account of this yes. coupling between density and current. But if you start calculating density uh, density, somehow they should require a full time problem. Yeah, I mean, if you want, you have to dress the density density also via the, the density, the, the, the row J, okay, right. which is. How do you get? It? How do you get? You start with higher or lower. Yeah. And at some point, you should include tight green J. Yeah. So the question is, what diagrammatic will be the higher or J? What's the first element? Because somehow you have to include the fact the propagator. Okay, let me see how we can tell you this way. So you have to include also the, the propagator of the transverse electromagnetic field, not only the Coulomb potential. This is what you have to do. And then uh, this guy is finite. That's the point. Even for Q going to zero, because you have an isotropy. And this is, so you can do actually everything at RPA level. And this is what we did also in the normal, in the metal, in the case of the metal. But the, the key point here that you have to take into account of this that you usually don't, okay? Uh, so what, how does this dispersion look like? So in this plot, I'm just choosing a finite angle for the propagation of, of the light. And uh, the color code is such that uh, Mm, the line which is totally blue is transverse and the line which is totally red is the longitudinal. So here's the dispersion. The nature of, of the polarization of the solution has to be computed afterwards, but if you want the color code already includes the, 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 the polarization of the solution. So I have a lower energy solution, which always goes to the lower energy plasma. So whatever is the value of the angle, I always end up here. I have an upper solution, omega plus, which always end up for K going to zero to the upper plasma, whatever is the value of the angle. 
You see the dashed line here are instead the standard RPA solution, the one that I showed you before, which is, as you can see, has different value for K going to zero, depending on the angle. And the blue line is the transverse, if you want, equivalent to this longitudinal plasma. And you see that in the RPA, actually, you didn't have the matching of the two for K going to zero. Okay. So what is our solution looks like? For very small momenta, you see that the, the mixing of the color means the solution have a mix of the longitudinal transverse character. When momentum increases, this solution matches with the value of the RPA, so it becomes a longitudinal mode, and the upper solution becomes a purely transverse mode. So the point is that uh, this, uh, if you want, the fact that for k equal to zero, the solution, the omega, the minus solution is always polarized along c, and the plus solution is always polarized in the plane. But if the momentum is finite, it means that this guy here has both the transverse and the longitudinal component. And this line here is both the longitudinal transverse component. So the solution k equal to zero have a mixed character. When momentum increases, somehow the polarization makes a rotation. The minus solution becomes a purely longitudinal mode. The plus solution becomes a purely transverse mode. What is the scale which is set to the crossover? The scale is just the anisotropy of the stiffness. And since usually this one is much larger than the other one, it essentially is, is this scale is set by the, uh, the, upper, um, the upper plasma, okay? So if you look at your system here, you don't see the, the mixing and RPA works pretty well, okay? But if you want to study the problem here, you have to the, take into account the mixing. And actually this solution that I showed you before, which is usually quoted in the, in the literature of the terror spectroscopy, is just an approximation of this omega minus branch for a very small momenta. So here again, the description is very good. When momenta exceed the critical value of the momentum, this approximate solution fails. Why? What is missing again in this description, and which, by the way, could include very easily nonlinear effect. This is again easily seen here. Let me rewrite this guy here and now in real space. So omega square is time derivative. K square is gradient in, in out of plane or in plane. And then the mixing here, which is KK, becomes mixed derivative in A and C direction, okay? You see, if I want to promote this model to a, a nonlinear model, I just have to take the master, which is omega C square, for example, and get it to a cosine. Okay, this is where I go from linear to nonlinear. And then I can write down two couple equation of motion for these uh, two variables. Again, writing the equation of motion is like solving the, the Maxwell, uh, the, the determinant in, a, in the linear model. And then you see here where is the approximation that people use. If you're working the frequency, which are of the order of the out of plane plasma frequency, which is much smaller than the in plane plasma frequency, you see here this time derivative term can be neglected compared to the other one. So I just take it out. I can derive the fluctuation. I can express the in plane fluctuation in terms of the out of plane. I replace it here, and then I get the equation that people usually quote in the literature in the context of terrors. So the real approximation, which is behind this, is essentially the following. I am looking at the problem at a very low energy near to the soft plasma. At this energy scale, I can neglect the time dependence of the current induced in the plane due to the coupling to the electric field. And this is the real approximation which is behind this. Okay, how much time do I have still? Perfect, so let me give you a hint. Okay, perfect. Let me tell you about application, okay? So here, the most difficult thing is to explain the experiment. I'll try to do my best just to give you a few ideas. Actually, uh, the first, uh, this was also where our interest to this problem came in. There are several experiments that are done uh, with the use of strong terrors like pulses. Strong pulses means that you can somehow measure a response in the current, which is beyond the linear response. So linear response is J proportional to E, Nonlinear response is J proportional to E to the cube, okay? Which kind of physics you can see? For example, you can see the generation of high harmonics. Typical experiment are done in several superconductors. You come with the pulse, which has a central frequency omega p in the terahertz, which is very strong. And what you measure in the transmitted or reflected component of the field is a component oscillating at three times the incoming frequency. So uh, uh, this three omega 
uh, oscillation is generated inside the sample. So you come with omega, you get a three omega out of that, and this is can easily be understood with the linear spectroscopy. These are experiments, for example, what about linear in D over DT term associated with order parameter diffusion? Uh, in which term, uh, Pierce, can, can you? No, Pierce is asking a question, but I didn't. Yeah, no, no. So um, yeah. in the classic work on time dependent Lander Ginsburg of, of Abrahams and Sonetta, they have linear in T, D by DT terms in the, in the action. Yeah. 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 Okay, this is this is a diffusion term, but this is present above TC. So below TC, you you get rid of dissipation. So that's the idea. Okay, at least for the soft plasma, because I said the soft plasma is below to delta. This is the beauty of the superconductor, because in the superconductor you can get a mode which is low in energies and damped. Okay, so these are really in in the metal. Indeed, I will come to that back to this in a moment. The, the story is slightly more complicated because you have to take into account also, also damping. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, but I, if I recall, those terms are still present in the superconductor as well. Um, so well, if they were there, would they have. You can get it. I mean, if you have a lot of impurities, you can have dissipation for finite frequency, you can have dissipative term. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. So uh, even, and okay, so maybe you, what you're asking, even in this, this. Yeah. This equation. How would it sometimes affect people add. That? Yes, they also add the dumping term. You're right. Okay, but this is a, so it's trivial. <laughs> what I mean, in the sense that if you have a dissipation, uh, you you always have a bit of dissipation channel for the mole. You will have a linear in linear in term here. But my, my, I will say the main focus here was to understand how you go from couple equation to the couple ones. If you want, of course, you are mm -hmm. right. If you have dissipation, you will have additional linear in T term. So sorry, I didn't get the question. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is an experiment for reflectivity along the C-axis. So you come with a very strong terror field, and then you see when the the cyst, when the, the um, linear linear response is the usual plasma age, no linear response, which means very strong terror field, and you see that apart from the plasma age, you have this bump here, which is three or three omega. So you have generation of third harmonic. Now, how you you can explain this kind of physics? For example, here it's very important to describe the plasma taking into account low linearity. Why? Because nonlinearity, the cosine term somehow naturally gives you nonlinear coupling between the phase and the gauge field. In the sense that if phi now is the phase gradient out of plane, if you explain this guy here, you have a term which is a square phi square, and then you can get a nonlinear current, which is somehow proportional to a to the cube, and the decay, the, the nonlinear kernel, will be proportional to the phase phase propagator. In physical words, this is a this is a system where two photons are exciting two plasma waves, okay? And this can be done in a resonant way when the frequency of the incoming uh, photon is near to the frequency of the plasma. And this is what people observe experimentally. This is the problem that actually we studied some, some year, one year before. And actually the description again is very simple if the, the field is uh, only propagating in the, um, in the plane, but you start to have finite momentum, then you need to have a description of the plasma, which accounts both for nonlinear effect and for the correct dispersion. And these are the kind of experiment when one would like to, to look at this. This is a more recent experiment and gave from the group of Andrei Cavalleri. Actually, it has been around for a while, but it's just been published now. So again, the experiment is complicated. Let me go to, to the main message. So you come with the mid infrared pump and then you excite a phonon, okay? So there is an infrared active phonon that is excited by the terrain field. Now, these phonons, the idea is that this phonon can decay in two plasma. So this is a bilayer system. So you see, instead of a single layer, you have two. So you have two soft plasma, which are this line here. And then the idea is that when the phonon decay in the two plasma, Somehow, and the signature of this is in a very complicated measurement of second harmonic generation of the, of the probe. But then the idea is that uh, somehow you excite a phonon, this phonon decays into plasma, and you can synchronize this plasma even above TC. So this has to do with the idea of field-induced superconductivity. How can it be that you pump a system with a strong terrace field and you get superconductivity even above TC? And then the bottom line is that you do that because above TC, you have a soup of phase fluctuation. So the system would be paired, but it's not phase coherent. But if you come with some, something that makes your phase coherent, you synchronize the phase, you get superconductivity. And then in all this story, 
actually you have to do calculation in some way. Of course, they, they already did some, but they had to resort to a very phenomenological model. But actually you can do that. You just need to couple the phone to your degrees of freedom for the plasma. And of course, in the moment where you have a very analytical way to describe the plasma, everything becomes easier to see. And then eventually you can really try to answer the question about uh, um, the relevance of these mechanisms for um, field and use superconductivity. These are experiments with uh, near field spectroscopy. This is again a complicated story, but the idea is that you see the, the SNOM signal, uh, you, you make the contrast between a, a superconductor, which is Lasco and gold. When you go below TC, there is the contrast in the superconductor be become huge, which is this SNOM signal going up. And um, this can be understood with the fact that there is a soft out of plane plasma emerging um, above um, below TC. But interestingly, the calculation with the Maxwell equation, so in the linear regime, give you a signal which is one order of magnitude smaller than what is measured. Okay. And then here is another point where nonlinearity can be can be important. And then of course there is a density response. Density response in what you probe with the uh, ILS, so in a, a energy um, and uh, electronic spectroscopy, in elastic uh, electronic spectroscopy, or uh, with RICS. And as I told you, this uh, mode, the, the lower and the upper, have a mix of the longitudinal and transverse character for intermediate moment. And this means they both appear in the density response. Of course, there is always the K square overall. And then if you can go somehow to this intermediate regime that requires high energy, high momentum resolution, and our colleagues are trying to, to get this using ELS and um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, along with the transmission electron microscopy, you can eventually manage to see two modes appearing in the spectrum of ELS. And this also, this will also be true in the metal. So the problem in the metal, if you really want to do the correct calculation of the density response, you have to put damping coming from quasi-particle excitation. And we are just working on this now. I say the description in, in the metal is largely more complicated from the formal point of view, but the bottom line is always the same. You have longitudinal transfers missing, and the model recovery purely longitudinal transfers character for large momenta. Okay, this is my take on message. Essentially, you have plasma waves in the layered system. Have a, in general, they mix the longitudinal transfers character. Notice that the crossover energy momentum depends on the light velocity. When C goes to infinity, this is zero. So this is why also these corrections are called sometimes relativistic, okay? So somehow if, uh, if C is really infinite, you don't have anything, you have purely longitudinal, purely transfer. But along, unless you are along the main axis, you have the mixing, but for very large momentum, anyhow, pure model recovered. This regime is what is relevant for terrestrial spectroscopy, especially the one uh, that uh, is really focused in the low energy terrestrial regime. In the high energy regime, well, it's relevant for rigs and deals in the way uh, energy momentum resolution is, is there today. Actually, RPA was well. So if you just focus on this experiment, you don't have to worry about all that I say today. But of course, the next generation experiment that they will eventually access the intermediate uh, energy momentum regime can uh, have to really worry about this kind of mixing behavior. And then this is where I hope we will go in the near future. And with this, I close you and I thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there is a question. How is the, your model is consistent with the famous Lorentz Doniak model for the superconductors. Yes, yeah. it's... okay. In, in the sense that they're all the same. I mean, in the sense that you, you can write a Lorentz Doniak model, you start from Gisbu Landau uh, theory, you just couple layers. I mean, uh, the issue here is not uh, um, how you write the model for the phase degrees of freedom. The model, the issue, how you couple the phase to the external electromagnetic field. So what I mean is that whatever you do uh, in uh, Okay, let me go back. If you are only interested in describing the phase degrees of freedom, the phase only action, and then any, any things you do will end up with the dynamic term, and then you will have a gradient in the, phase, in the plane, a gradient out of plane. So th that's always, any, any approximation you do for long wavelength limit will give you this. 
here the problem is how you describe the coupling of this to the electromagnetic field. It's not just the issue of describing the phase degrees of freedom, so the superconducting degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. The problem is how the superconducting degrees of freedom interfere with the electromagnetic field. And uh, even for Law Lawrence Donick model, you can always end up with this. The problem is what you are computing. So what is your goal? <laughs> what do you want to do with once that you have the model? Okay. Other question? This is related to applications. Um, let me ask uh, first about RICS. So my understanding is the vertex day is P dot A, not density density, right? And that changes the game. Because if you go out of resonance, you see nothing. If you go out of? Out of resonance, if you, um, in, in if the, you the, incoming the, X-ray yeah? is not in resonance, then response is vanishing. No, okay, the point is that uh, it depends where you are in energy and momentum. With X-rays, usually you have very large momentum and very large energy. So if you look at the problem in that regime, uh, what is it here? Uh, so in this regime here, somewhere here on here, you don't care about the mixing. So in the, in the regime of very large momentum, which is what you probably with Ricks and Hills, and usually also very large energy. So here you have one electron volt at 0 0.5, what is the resolution here? So it's a fraction of electron volt. So essentially you're looking at everything here and here you only see, let's say mode, we have a pure longitudinal transverse character because you don't appreciate the mixing between the two. So RPA works pretty well. You don't have okay. to, to okay. care about so that. So then you say that your P dot A vertex is same as. So somehow it's, it's again the coupling of the of the phase with the gauge field also have a one over C uh, below. Where is it? Uh, <clears throat> when C is infinite, you don't care about the coupling to the to the gauge field. Okay, uh, if I may, as another yeah. question is about answer. So over there you couple to surface plus. No, the yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is correct. What I what I studied so far is just the back plasma. In this norm experiment, uh, of course, you what you are doing, you are coupling the surface just as some plasma. So this is uh, also what I didn't even write in preparation. <laughs> this is the next step to understand how the surface plasma connected to this layer the uh, plasma will behave. Yeah, perfectly correct. Uh, excuse me. As far as I understood, uh, the coupling between the longitudinal and, and transverse modes uh, appears only by the uh, if anisotropy is present, right? Yes. So if you make now the anisotropy extremely large, yeah. So basically reducing the dimensionality, do they decouple again the transverse? Well, in a sense, yes, because uh, if you want to, you have the, the, you have two energy scale here. So if you look at the the, the analytical solution uh, here, and this is the beauty of analytic. So you have a two scale, omega A, B and omega C. So you can decide the, what is your small parameter here. So you can expand in K with respect to this anisotropy. You can take the, this one is much larger than the other and then you will have, uh, will end up with solution with essentially only one and of them. Will but appear. then it should be the kind of an optimal value of anisotropy for largest possible coupling. Can you mm, no, well, uh, uh, I wouldn't look at this way in the sense that uh, system, we have a real system, so we don't have to, to invent so in the sense that we know what is the anisotropy <laughs> real material, usually the anisotropy is that the in-plane is of the order of the electron volt and the out of plane is fraction of milli electron volt, okay? So these are the numbers. And this is the numbers that we have to play with. They're so not tunable from... Not um, much tunable. So I, maybe you can play a little bit, for example, in Cuprace, there is some spreading of this uh, out of plane energy scale, which depends a little on the Belayer structure, so, but variation are still in the milli electron volt scale and this guy is still one electron volt so there is not much now if you try to apply this to transition metadical cogenate other layered materials maybe you could achieve somehow or you can imagine to engineer some ether structure where you you couple it and you can can try to to see it for example but you see if the anisotropy but, but, becomes but your, your analytical expression should give you the optimal coupling just if you but optimal coupling is optimal what? Mean, meaning meaning well well, uh, in a sense, okay, you have an, uh, you the, can... The, 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 the response of LG, chi LG is largest. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the crossover scale is this one. 
So you know that in the formula, this is a crossover scale. So you can play with this one, you can make it smaller or larger. But okay, making it larger, I find it a bit difficult in the sense that uh, you have to increase uh, the in-plane plasma frequency. And this, uh, I mean, you cannot usually do more than, I mean, even if you take a system, you dop it, I mean, this is N over M. So these are the materials we have. You, you can a little bit, but not, uh, not in a way that you can really go from inverse micron to, inverse, I don't know, uh, nan nanometer, something like that. So I, I don't imagine that this can be done, but maybe maybe it's possible. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's thank Laura once again. Thank you. And next we'll have the poster presentations. Okay, so there will be uh, one minute presentation for those.